Can you tell me some of the experiments that you've done? Let's take the audience through a couple of the experiments. So one, you amputate a frog's leg and then you're able to regenerate it, so on and so on. Maybe outline three that you find sure. most flabbergasting. Sure, sure. Um, okay, uh, let's see. So, 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 so here's one. If you use a voltage-sensitive fluorescent dye, which basically just reports, you, you flood your, your tissue with it and it just reports f f with, with um, different types of uh, fluorescence, it reports where the different voltage values are. If you look at the early embryo as it's putting its face together, uh, for example, you will see something we call the electric face. And this was discovered in work with my colleague, Danny Adams, where we found this thing called the electric face, which is basically that prior to all the genes being turned on that are required to make different face components and so on, and certainly prior to the anatomy, there is a an electrical pre-pattern that you see in that region that basically looks like a face. You can see where the eyes are going to be because that's where the voltage is different. You can see where the mouth is going to be. You can see where the placodes on the side of the head are going to be. And so you see this electrical face, and it and it raised the obvious uh, the obvious question, which is that if that pattern is instructive then you ought to be able to do two things. You ought to be able to mess it up and thus uh, disrupt mm -hmm. that electrical pattern and thus get defects in craniofacial patterning. And, and certainly you can do that. And in fact, there are even human channelopathies where humans have mutations in ion channels that give them craniofacial birth defects and defects of limb and brain and other things. So, that, 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 so that's, that's true. But the other thing, the more exciting thing you might be able to do is to take some of those electrical patterns and move them somewhere else. And you could say, okay, if, if this is the type of pattern that says to the cells, build an eye here, could we move that electrical state to somewhere else? Not move the cells, but move the electrical pattern, re reintroduce that electrical pattern somewhere else and, and get it to build an eye. And so this is actually, we, we did this, this is some of our, some of our earlier work, um, you know, around uh, 2007 or so we, we discovered this. Uh, basically, you take one ion channel that's able to induce a particular electrical pattern in, in, the, in a region of cells, and you inject RNA encoding that ion channel in some other part of the embryo that's going to be gut, let's say. Okay, it's going to make endoderm, it's going to make gut cells. And sure enough, uh, and, so, and so three things are significant about what happens. The first is that you get an eye, and you get an eye in the middle of the gut, you get an eye constructed from cells that were going to be gut. So this is remarkable because if you look at the um, uh, uh, developmental biology textbooks, what you will see is that they say that cells outside of the anterior neurectoderm are not competent to become eyes. They're not supposed to be able to make eyes. And that's true if you use the, the biochemical master eye gene, PAC6. If you, if you try to re induce eyes with PAC6, that's true. It doesn't form any. You can't get ectopic eyes anywhere outside the head. But by in introducing this bioelectric pattern, you can. And so that's so that's the first thing that you you can you can go beyond the known uh, competency limits by using this very upstream sort of master regulator this this electrical pattern. The second thing that's interesting about it is that the information content that we provide by putting in this channel is extremely low. We don't micro specify the details of how to make an eye. You know, eye has a dozen cell types all arranged in a particular way. We don't know how to do that. We we couldn't possibly do you know we couldn't possibly do that. In fact, what, what we do instead is provide a very simple signal that to a programmer basically looks like a subroutine call, right? It's a trigger. It's a trigger for a cascade that, you, that the animal already knows how to do. It already knows how to make eyes. We're not saying how to make an eye. What we're saying is make an eye here by triggering that, that eye building module, which includes all the gene expression, everything else that's downstream. So that modularity, that, that, that incredible um, engineering trick that, uh, that, that says that you can call up, once you know how to do something, you can reuse it in other places. The fact that these bioelectrical states are triggers of developmental subroutines. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the second cool thing about it. The third cool thing about it is that if you label the cells that you are injecting the channel RNA into with some with a with a color, so you can t so you can tell which cells actually got the the okay. the, the, ch the extra channel, and then you and then you look at that eye that you've created. What you will see is that often, for example, half the eye will have the channel you put in; the other half, the eye doesn't have it. That means that what the cells that you affected, what they did was they recruited their normal neighbors. Right, which by themselves were never modified by you. They were completely wild type, and, and and yet they got recruited by their neighbors to be part of this thing. So there's two levels of instruction here. There's instruction by us 
saying to a region, you make an eye. And then there's a secondary instruction by those cells that say, oh, and by the way, I'm going to need more cells. Hey, you guys over here, you're going to be part of this lens. And they all come and they, even the ones that we never directly affected. And so this third part is cool because, well, this, the, 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 the second part is cool. The, the fact that it's, it's modular and a trigger is cool because that means that you can achieve regenerative medicine outcomes, things that are way too complex for us to micromanage by using triggers. If we can identify the triggers of the subroutines that we want, make an eye, make a limb, make a liver, then we can trigger those things long before we actually know all the details about how to micromanage it, right? So part of, part of um, reverse engineering, and I very much see this as a reverse engineering task, part of reverse engineering is finding out all the cool hooks in the system that are already there for you. Not that you have to put them together from scratch, but they're already there for you. Yeah, what is the trigger that, that's the build and eye subroutine? What other subroutines are there? Right. That's 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 part of our job. The other the thing that's cool about that third part is that it's non cell autonomous, meaning you can exert effects on cells without touching them directly because cells communicate to each other. So by convincing mm -hmm. a bunch of cells over here that they should make an eye, you, in effect, uh, affect a bunch of other cells and cause them to be part of that eye without having to touch them directly. And that comes up. Sorry, that's what you meant when you were talking about recruiting. Yeah, earlier exactly exactly right exactly right yeah so that's so that's kind of the first so that's the first example um that 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 i would i would talk about the second example i would talk about uh has to do with has to do with cancer and so michael is it okay if we hold on that cancer result because okay. what you said was so profound and i want to unpack it okay sure sure yeah well, we'll hold on tell me if this is broadly correct let's imagine i'm a frog when okay. a frog is developing before an eye or a stomach or a throat or whatever it is is made, you see some adumbration, some adumbration, some electrical adumbration, like a hint of it. And then what you could do is you can say, well, there's some pattern. Let's imagine it's a circle, to be simplistic. There's some circular voltage gradient, and that means eye. So what if I induce that? What if I induce a voltage gradient over here near the heart? I know you said something, but whatever. Over here. Then what will happen? is instead, ordinarily, we would think, well, you'd need to micro-tune that eye, each molecule. It's extremely difficult to make an eye. We don't actually know how to, from the bottom up, molecularly make an eye. But we see this pattern. What if we put that pattern on the heart or the stomach? Oh, lo and behold, some time amount later, then an eye is born. Is that correct? Yeah, that's that, that's that's correct. And the, and the only thing I would add to that, first of all, is that the reason I was I was telling you about that electric face pattern is because it's kind of the most obvious one in the sense that the electric face pattern actually looks like a face. You can't miss it. It just, it just looks like a face. But not all of them are that simple. Some of them are really um, kind of... Uh, um, it, they're, they're encoded more deeply such that by, by staring at it, you can't tell yeah, what it's going to yeah. be, right? So, so for example, uh, there, there, are, there are other patterns that we've seen where the only way we know what they are is, is by watching what they make. We, you couldn't have guessed. You know, the, mm, the, so, so mm -hmm. some, some of them are very direct, almost a paint by numbers. You can sort of see what's going to happen. And others are really complicated and you need uh, computational tools to deconvolve what you're looking at to figure out what it's going to be. So, so not all of them are as obvious as, as the electric face pattern, right? Yeah. One of the questions I had was, why hasn't this been found out before? Was there a technological limit or did they just not look at cells with the dye that give an indication of voltage gradients or optogenetic technologies and so on? Yeah. So, so, that, so, so that's an interesting question. Why, 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 why not before? I mean, on the one hand, everything has to have a beginning at some point, right? So, so whenever it was, it would have, you know, you could have asked, well, like, why not before, right? But, In hindsight, but, it's but always obvious. Yeah. You can always, you can always say that, but, but let's, but let's kind of dig into that. Um, on the one hand, there was a conceptual uh, leap that kept this pretty much under. I mean, let, let's be clear. I, I am not the first person to talk about the importance of bioelectric signals. People have been studying endogenous bioelectricity since before 1900. So, so it certainly has occurred to people that maybe electrical signals are important in development regeneration. All, all of my work, I was, I was incredibly um, heavily inspired by by work that was done in this in the 60s 70s and 80s by by a bunch of people that worked really hard on this stuff the reason that it hadn't gone far enough was to, to two reasons number one the tools weren't there so these dyes didn't exist all they had was traditional mm -hmm. electrophysiology okay. in traditional electrophysiology you have one electrode and you're poking it into cells and if you want to have a picture of what's going on you got to poke all the cells and that's just completely Im Im impractical right these these dyes didn't exist the conceptual thing was that 
um, around the time that this stuff was was taking off using using electrodes and things like that, uh, biochemistry and molecular biology took off. And the thing, the th the reason molecular biology drew all the attention is because you could do molecular biology and biochemistry in dead fixed tissue. So you can you can kill and fix your cells, and you can sequence the DNA, you can sequence the RNA, you can get a proteome, you can get a uh, you know all of these all of these kinds of things you can do. None of that is possible with bioelectrics. So the minute your cell is dead, all of it goes away. So none mm. of the typical omics approaches work. So it's 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 uh, it's it's that much harder. And so it really lagged behind because all the interest went into the molecular uh, you know kind of molecular biochemistry. Mm -hmm. And uh, and it had to wait for some of these tools to to come up. The third thing the third thing is is that I think while while people did uh, think about uh, the the importance of these bioelectric gradients, n nobody, to my knowledge, uh, be before we did it, really thought about it as the beginnings of the nervous system and to really put that computational spin on it. The, the fact that this thing really is like a neural network doing computations about development. I, I think that's new. I, I will say, um, Harold Burr, who was this guy was working in the thirties, 1930s, forties and fifties. Okay. He had one of the first good voltmeters around and he went around measuring things, you know, uh, elm trees and rabbits and tumors and, and embryos and all kinds of stuff on the basis of this. He wrote an amazing book um, that basically said most of the things that we're discovering now. The guy had a crystal ball. It's incredible. It's, it's absolutely incredible. So he he could clearly see a lot of this stuff. The thing, the the one thing he did not see because at the time it didn't exist was the computational aspects and the and the really the link to um you know to 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 this as as a kind of neuroscience done in another space and morphous space. That I think is is new. But but. Uh, People had already had these ideas and it needed the technology to really make it, to really prove them out and to really see how it works.